learned a lot about life, and I just don't regret a minute of it, even over times that I regretted being there a whole lot. Something that's been with me all my life, and I just don't regret it now. For the most part, instead of urging the men to go on and do things, we had to urge the men to slow down and stop doing things. Well, I'm Jim Mullaney, okay. and uh, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I uh, joined the parachute troops in 1942 in April. Then I went to the 503rd Parachute Troops at Fort Bragg. And uh, as the regiment was formed, I was put in H Company. I spent the war in H Company as a platoon leader, a company executive officer, and on the last mission on Negroes Island in the Philippines, I was company commander. I think I knew every man in the company personally, and uh, closer than any could ever be to a brother. I knew his faults, I knew his virtues, and I learned from him. It's a wonder to me now how little I knew before I met these men and how much I learned from them. They were brave, and they wanted to get the war over with. They wanted to go home, just like all the rest of us did. And there was no hiding in the 503 or in H Company. But they weren't going to take any shortcuts. They weren't going to say they were hurt when they weren't hurt or anything like that. And to this day, a day never goes by that I don't recall their bravery and what good men they were, what those men went through, day after day for three years. And so many of them were killed and wounded. So many of them were sick and sent home. And new ones would come in, 17, 18 years old. They just thought that they weren't going to be hurt or killed. They were life or death with them. They weren't going to be one of the victims. No matter how many men around us were killed, they, a lot of times they wouldn't take cover. They had to be ordered to take cover. And they just had one thing in mind, killing Japs and getting the war over with. And one of the main questions that was always asked, will there be enough Japs to go around? We all want somebody to kill. And they meant every word of it. When they showed the stand table, most everybody knew it was Corregidor. My thought on it at the time was I was very anxious to go. But I told them this was going to be a rough one, and they also they knew that. But they were all just as eager as I was to go. We knew the island was alive. There were people down there ready to kill us when we jumped, even on the way down. The island was built up into Fort Mills, indeed a mighty fortress in the sea, often likened to Gibraltar for its importance to the U.S. defense of the Philippines. Uh, my name is Ron Binadero. I am the island manager of Corregidor Foundation Incorporated. Uh, the island of Corregidor came from the Spanish time on the boat going to Manila must pass to Corregidor to correct and to check. I think this island is the most beautiful place to visit in World War II. Remnants, artifacts and everything so that you can see the guns in the island, the museum, you can see the old pictures inside and also the longest barracks before the war and the old hospital here that's capacity of 1,000 bed hospital that's big hospital in time, the Philippines. Because we have old maps, old, you know, formerly top secret maps, we're allowed to go anywhere we want on the island. We'll look for a specific building and it's really exciting when you come across, especially a, a fairly well-preserved two-story or three-story building out in the jungle that you had no idea still existed. The amount of steel and concrete on this island is absolutely incredible and I have people asking me all the time, how did they get these things in place? And it's a very difficult question to answer because, you know, this was stuff that happened a hundred years ago and even I can't come up with how they could have gotten literally tons and tons of steel and concrete into some of these places on the sides of hills. It must have taken thousands of men carrying bags of concrete and, and mules and powerful engines and so on. These buildings were made to last. In fact, when they were designed, they were considered to be bomb-proof. 
But you have to understand that when they were designed, people weren't dropping 2,000 pound bombs from the air. Where the buildings were not heavily bombed by a Japanese in 1942 and the Americans in 1945, they've held up very, very well. So my father saw Corregidor go from a paradise to hell. Corregidor was to be the last holdout of the U.S. military forces guarding Manila Bay. Before it fell on May 6, 1942, it was to need all of the steel and concrete that had gone into its fortifications during the prior 40 years. Japan declared war on the United States and its allies on December 7, 1941. Following Pearl Harbor, life on Corregidor would never be the same. For the people on Corregidor, as well as the whole of the Philippine archipelago, noon had become high noon. Time and fate in the form of a victory swollen Japanese war machine were inexorable. Manila fell. Bataan was driven to her knees. The Filipinos and the Americans on Corregidor dug deep into their fortress of rock and awaited the lash of the gathering storm. After the surrender of Bataan on April 9, the Japanese began a relentless artillery and aerial bombardment of Corregidor. That continued until its surrender on May 6. In the meantime, I missed out on the Bataan Death March, which was a story all by itself. And it wasn't that bad for that month. Well, it was bad enough. We really got bombed and shelled. Chief Nurse Ann Neeler Giles recalls her feelings on that day. She's seen today as she works in the garden of a San Antonio home with her daughter, Sally Ann. It looked pretty bad to some of us who were there. We knew deep down inside that it couldn't be true. When the initial shock wore off, we learned the truth, that General MacArthur had received direct orders from Washington to fly immediately to Australia. That was all we needed to know. So we set ourselves to staying alive there in the Malinta Tunnel. It wasn't too long after that that we heard that MacArthur was going to go to uh, get away from Corregidor and, and go south, and that we were supposed to take him. I was on one of the boats that took off from Corregidor, and that's how I got off Corregidor. He had a chance to go out in the submarine, which had been safe, but he went out on what they call PT boats then. He took a chance with his life right there. We heard the uh, Boys of America, General MacArthur, arrived in Australia was given a uh, no passing review in no parade. And General MacArthur went down to the grandstand. He pulled out the flipping flag and said, I will return. And everybody's crying there, you know, and we're waiting for him. The primary object of which is the relief of the Philippines. I came through and I shall return. I'm a, a hillbilly from Tennessee. The last day of the over was like life on a bullseye. The enemy bombs missed very little on the island that day. We got right down to work. I tied my hair up in a piece of gauze. Then I went to the operating room where I gave anesthetics to one casualty after another. When all the casualties had been cleared, I realized that we had not eaten since morning. Our water supply had been hit during the bombing, which caused us to have to ration our water to one drink a day. 
And it was like that for 26 days of continuous bombing. Corregidor now assumed a defensive posture as nearly all of its guns and mortars were being destroyed by Japanese air and land bombardment. As many as 16,000 shells a day pounded the rock, an average of one every five seconds. And I remember too, when we were getting shells, all oh, one of those shells coming. I was in battery way then when we were practicing up, and, and I had to go quite a ways to where we ate. And uh, my buddy and I would, uh, we'd wait for a burst of shell, and we'd run, duck, wait for a few more, and run again. And I remember one time the shell hit the uh, uh, ammunition dump. <laughs> In April of 1942, the island of Corregidor was a fortress besieged. The defenders fought back with the little they had, but it wasn't enough. After six straight days of a brutal battering from the skies, the people of Corregidor plunged deep into gloom and unabashed fear. Corregidor calling, Corregidor calling, Corregidor calling, Corregidor calling. So many soldiers that they just overwhelmed us. There's nothing we could do about it. I'd say we did a pretty good job with what we, equipment we had. We did pretty good until the war went until the, they finally decided to land. Actually surrendered to a very inferior force. And so the enemy came. <laughs> And on the evening of May 5th, they gathered at Cap Cabin, which is about 10 kilometers north, straight north of here. About 11.30 at night, they got in their landing craft and they began to cross. About that time, the moon came up. It was about a half moon at that point. And the Americans were able to see them, but it was only Battery Way that was left firing, because Battery Geary had been destroyed. Of the three guns that the Macello was able to get working at Battery Way, only one was still in operation. They knocked the other two out. So my father's gun crew, because he was the sergeant on that last gun, he had his hands full. They estimate that they fired about 128 shells at the Japanese landing craft as they were coming in. 128 shells. The gun got so hot that it literally was glowing red in the dark. They were so successful that General Homa, sitting over on Bataan with his field glasses, was crying because he thought the initial assault was a failure. We fired all night. Got, uh, it got to be about six in the morning. It's getting light anyway. And then we had orders uh, from somebody on the beach there to quit firing because we had been kept raising our gun up. In the meantime, we got about 14 barges on, and there was quite a few on one barge. We kept raising our gun up, and, we, and we were, the shells were landing on the beach, and they told us to quit firing because they're killing Marines. Just at that same time, we had to quit because the, the breach of the barrel was so hot, it just you couldn't put any more in. We had to give up, surrendered at 11 o'clock that morning, and were taken in. That was the end of Corregidor. Then they came down and took Corregidor from the tunnel. Once they took the tunnel, that's the end of it, because that's where all the gold bricks were hanging around. I guess we were at the end of the line anyway regarding food and things of that sort, endurance of personnel. Most of the men were hanging around down the Milena Tunnel, and they can get tunnelitis. You may have heard of that term. Go out, everybody. Leave the tunnel, go out there. So we leave everybody. Put your hand up like this. Huh? Go out. But maybe I'm a hero. I don't know. But I know I'm a prisoner. <laughs> uh, Everett Reamer, the F Battery 60th Coast Artillery, and the aircraft at Battery Shaney on Corregidor. The morning of May 6th, 
our company commander came in and said that we'd been ordered to surrender and so to destroy our armaments that we had uh, alongside of the, the roadway going into Melinda and uh, 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 shortly thereafter General Wainwright was brought out of the tunnel along with some Japanese staff and uh, I uh, was within probably 50 foot of him and uh, he looked to the right and to the left and with his head kind of hung down and I could see tears on his cheek, started seeing and viewing dead bodies. You couldn't look 20 foot in any direction without seeing a dead body. As the war in the Pacific progressed, many names came into focus. Guadalcanal, Bougainville, Kwajalein, Moratai, New Guinea, Leyte. As the U.S. forces under General Douglas MacArthur pushed northward from Australia, the name Corregidor stuck in the general's craw like a fishbone. He had vowed to return, and return he would, but it would be a long and bloody road back. The retaking of this tiny island Tonight, would possibly mean more emotionally to him than I any other. I shall return. The Isle of Delusion would become the Isle of Destiny. When Japanese soldiers pulled down the Stars and Stripes, it may have been the end of Corregidor, but it was also the beginning of the road back. When U.S. paratroopers hoisted their flag on the same pole three years later with Douglas MacArthur in attendance, it essentially signaled the end of Japan. The Japanese occupied this island from 1942 until early 1945. While the Americans were no threat, they only had a few platoons on the island. Only about 300 Japanese were here. Uh, they were actually thinking of Corregidor as a nice vacation spot when the war was over. There was good reason to remember Bataan. Men died, and those few who lived through the infamous death march became the walking ghosts of Bataan. Its determined strands reaching out hungrily for Corregidor. The Rock, sometimes called the Gibraltar of the East. Other military objectives may have been more important from a strategic point of view, but none meant more symbolically than this hunk of rock sitting on the sea. For them, there was a score to settle. Uh, then a guy come around from the airborne and uh, wanted to know if any volunteers would want to join the repair troops. I told Mom, I'm going to go join the Army, $50 a month. I thought, wow, that's a lot of money. That's more than $21 that we were getting. Actually come running to me one day with his pamphlet in his hand. He said the Army wanted paratroopers. Gonna give us 50 bucks more pay. He wanted me to go. I didn't hesitate. To put the icing on the cake, when I found out that if you became a paratrooper, you could get $50 a month extra, I jumped at the chance. What was your reason for joining the paratroopers? Well, the reason was strictly money. And that's when I seen these practice parachute jumps. So I just talked to one of the guys. He says, piece of cake. I said, well, I like cakes, so I'll join. And some, some young lady ran across the field and she said, did you hear what happened? You know? She said, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. You know? Instantly, it didn't even make much of an impression. We continued playing football. You know? For the rest of the afternoon, when we got home, of course, my mother and everybody else was talking about nothing else but that. You know? I think I was like everybody else. I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. My brother had been captured. He was a Japanese prisoner. I don't know whether he made the pretend death march. But I thought maybe he was on Corregidor. In fact, that was our Gibraltar. That was our great fortress. Unbelievable that we had lost our, our fortress. Nobody could take Corregidor. Bougainville made a jump on No. 4. And we got ready to sail and we went to the Philippines. And the first island we hit on the Philippines was uh, Leyte. And then uh, we were there two months. So we got to Mandoro January, 
And about three weeks later, we were told we were going to jump on Corregidor. That's the first I had ever heard of Corregidor. A team was forming. Each mission, the team got better. They knew what they were looking for, and they looked for it, and they concentrated. And uh, being truthful, they didn't tell us where we were going, what we were doing. I, Douglas MacArthur came right to our camp in Gordonvale, and I could have touched him like you're sitting here. That's so easy. Now, well, he said, get me some Japs. That's all he said. I've been asked, was I mad when I hit Corregidor? I answered them, hey, the Nips bombed Pearl Harbor. There's an Nanking Reef. Now we've got the death march on our hands. How could you ask me, do I hate the Japs? You're damn right I hated them. I hated them with a passion. And I had no inkling when I saw a Jap, he was gonna die. When we got announced to, that if we were gonna jump on the Corregidor, of course, like I said, we'd had a mission after mission canceled. And when that was announced, we were really joyful. Man, that was an honor. We were gonna get to take back our fortress. Everybody was, was really keyed up. I mean, we were ready for it. We got an estimate to be 600 or 800 Japs on the island. I was told that that was caused by the Filipinos. They gave me that estimate. Filipinos weren't lying, but after the Filipinos were kicked off the island, the Japanese forces had moved in practically overnight. Forces increased about 6,000. The Japanese were defending the island the way that they had taken it, which was by landing barge. So the Americans fooled them. They came by parachute. That no one in his right mind would even consider dropping a regiment of paratroopers on such a small target. Naval bombardment, aerial attack, amphibious landings, and a parachute drop. The 503rd Regimental Combat Team was the jump regiment picked to do the job. Corregidor is the key island guarding Manila Bay. At the time, we didn't know there were 6,000, but it turned out there were. But always when you have an assault, a marine assault, which is essentially what happened, and in this case also paratroopers, the first thing that happens is the Navy comes in and pounds the island for a month or so, and the Air Force is also, and that's what happened. During the month previous to the Americans returning, they dropped over 3,000 tons of bombs on this island. Time for the jet was running out. went to our briefing. Each officer took his platoon in there. We got up that morning, didn't get a very good breakfast, so very much regret later on, and go and eat field rations then on too. I think the, the troops of the 503rd were enthusiastic about the jump. Of course, uh, any veteran paratrooper knows that when he jumps into an operation, that he's jumping into the unknown. He expects to be surrounded, outnumbered, and outgunned. But I think at the time of the drop, the troops were really ready to go. We had two drop zones and two series of planes that came in single file over each drop zone. The wind uh, was blowing we actually didn't know prior to the jump what the weather was going to be, but we knew that the wind was a factor. And this really was the, the, the weather part of the operation that had made us uh, alter our plan somewhat. I was at the graduate jump master school, and I, I knew what I was doing. Not much solo when you're, you know, look at a little field, you got 23 men there that are you got your live in the hands, you know. That was my big worry, was getting those guys on that field, you know, in the jump area. And I got every one of mine, not a one of them blew back across belt, belt road, belt line road. The time between the moment when you, when you exit the plane and you hit the ground, you saw him at this one, that fast. One plane, one moment you're coming out the door and the next moment you're on the ground. We knew the island was alive. There were people down there ready to kill us when we jumped, even on the way down. When the slug goes by, you hear like a, like a 
crack of a whip, just like that. That's when the slug will bite. If uh, you don't hear it, then it probably hits you. So we went to the uh, various, uh, uh, the airstrip on Mendora Island, and uh, we took off about 7, 7.15. It's a very short flight, about 90 miles. But of course, they got formation and all that, took longer than that. And we jumped at 8 o'clock. I came in on the uh, golf course. We came with the 3rd Battalion, and I was uh, one of the first ships. Opened up over the center of the jump field. The wind was, uh, was coming up the sides of the slopes and it blew us back out over the uh, edge of the cliff, not too far down. I caught in a tree, and uh, which, which was fortunate because it kept me from falling further over the cliff. It seemed like it took a long time to take the tension off and get out of there. This is called Topside Parade Ground. There was a drop zone in American history. When the Americans first came back here to take the island, they dropped here and on the golf course. Dick was hoping to hit the golf course. Unfortunately, he ended up in the rough. If you know what a football field looks like, I hit about the 50-yard line. Oh, get your butt down on the ground and, and get out of the way. Unbuckle and take positions and wait and get your order and see what they want to do. Top side, watch. They don't come up the side because that's where they say all the Japanese were. They did tell us that that we would probably, if we left too late out of the plane, we were going to be ending up in the seat. I was the second guy out the door. The first guy out the door was a army photographer. And he had never jumped in his life, but he did, he jumped, he jumped, and I pushed him out the door and I went right up behind him. Exiting the plane after we got to go to, to jump, as the line moved, each man had his hand on the man in back of him and he went straight out the door almost as fast as one man could go the whole string went. I landed in a bomb crater flat on my back. My chute went over the the edge of the bomb crater and collapsed itself. I had no problem there. And I, as I've said before, thank my lucky stars. It was a good jump. The photographer was standing on the edge of the uh, bomb crater. He had jumped before I did, and he got my landing. Made a picture of it. A big shell hole hit in the crater and smashing my weapon. I thought my rib was all broke on that side, but they weren't. <laughs> came out pretty good. Nobody in my group got hurt. We all landed in the drop zone. Uh, the ride to Corregidor was very short. The profile was about 90 miles. But the uh, plane took longer than that because they had to get in formation. Now, the closer we got, the more excited the uh, red light came on when we were during the jump area. How you all tied up the hookup, they seemed to come come alive. It sounded like uh, a football team that go on the field at the beginning of the game. They were yelling and screaming, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. We started off jumping eight men at about, I believe, 550 feet jump altitude, which is a fairly low altitude for a parachute jump. As each plane in the serial would come over a pre-arranged point, we would give the word to count a certain number of seconds, and then the first man of that stick would go out. We started off jumping eight people in a stick, at, a stick meaning the number that it's going to jump at that pass over the drop zone. But because of the, the wind, which uh, turned out to be about 22 knots, uh, we had to lower our altitude successively from 550 to 500 and then finally 400 feet. I had the carbine, the 30 caliber, that's a folding stock, and I also had the base plate for the mortar, which was 12 pounds, plus your reserve chute, plus ammunition, plus your back chute the whole nine and, yards. And the main chute didn't open in some cases and it was just kind of wrapped around itself and of course we were coming in at about 500 feet 
So 500 feet, if the chute doesn't open, in about three seconds you're standing on the ground. 2,000, about then your chute open. Well at 500 feet, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, you're standing on the ground. So it, it has to pop. So what happened in some of these cases, the chute was trying to open and just maybe even the depth of a shell hole gave you enough more time for that chute to pop open. And once you pop open, you, you dead stop almost. I tried to uh, uh, climb up the rises and tip the chute so it wiped the wind, but the wind was just too much. Right after the six minute went out, I saw his back and I was right on him and just this chute when it came out of the pack, it almost hit me. And uh, my helmet was broken, his genit and back and the traps, uh, uh, straps that were broken out of it because I was coming backwards. The wind was blowing pretty hard and my heels hit first and then I went back like that and the back of my head hit and broke the straps. The helmet did, I wasn't dizzy or anything. They dropped 2,000 men on the initial drop. Of that 2,000, approximately, I guess 15 were killed by Japanese, three the chutes failed open and they, they killed them, or were killed. Two more smacked in the side of buildings and were killed. Some of the guys that were killed were actually hung up in some of the trees that were still here. Next morning, the 503rd paratroopers and 31st infantry were outnumbered about two to one. The battle for Corregidor raged for two weeks while across the bay, the battle for Manila was in full blaze. Of the 6,000 Japanese who defended their position on the rock, 42 were alive at the end of hostilities. The next morning, the Americans suffered about a thousand casualties with slightly more than 200 dead. And I think I did, and I think a lot of the other guys did. You said your prayers, you got it all out of the way. It wasn't like you were praying all the way in. It was like, well, I should say my prayers and I make sure my ammo's where it is. And you got all of those things out of the way so you didn't have to think about it. Then you just thought about jumping. As the men land and get rid of their chutes, they form into units each pushing out in a different direction toward the plateau's perimeter. We worked our way up the, uh, up, up the hill. Actually, I didn't engage anybody coming up the hill. I got up to the top of the jump zone without, without doing that. I spent a lot of time after that uh, picking up uh, uh, guys that were, you know, a bad leg or, or not, not wounded, but hurt from the jump. Third battalion came in first, and then the first battalion. And the third, the, the second battalion, they came in. They came in down at the south dock. Yeah, but as soon as we got on the ground, they were all pretty normal again. We were talking to each other, and uh, I think you've been told there's no shooting or anything. But like walking around like we were on a parade ground. We strolled over to the assembly area. Yeah, but sort of wasn't real. Because I thought there'd be chaps in every tree, and I didn't see any for. I don't know. I think everybody's pretty relaxed. Twin brothers. And they, they both hit the ocean. And I found out after we were on top side that these two guys had gone overboard because one of them was picked up by a PT boat. They thought, well, we just picked you up. It took 10, 15 minutes to get to the assembly area, and that's when I saw my first test. That night, I spent the, the night on a perimeter uh, in between the. Uh, the, the water tanks up. And there was some inf infiltration during the night. They, they came in the road. Man, they were, they were great at that. The, the night was theirs. A good soldier is a coward. He'll take cover everywhere he can. They told us, don't fire at night because the enemy will know where you are. Well, they knew where we were. As soon as it got dark, they started coming up along right under the balcony of the building tossing grenades up there. So quite, we were jumping from one room to the other to get away from those grenades. So I thought, well, oh crap, this is, this is not going to get it. I said, you're not going to kill us without us firing a shot. So next time we heard this guy scrambling up there, I reached over with the BAR and I just sprayed the area. And I heard him moan. And he didn't toss any more grenades. But he kept moaning all night. So the next morning, one of the guys come, went down the door. I heard him say, you dirty bastard, you get me awake all night. So he boom, one shot, and that was it. He was dead. He 
effects of war is hell. Civilians in this country know nothing about it. And, uh, I hope they never do. It wasn't like other places in the Philippines where there were Filipino civilians. Here, the nice part, there was just them and us. And so if, if it moved, it was the enemy or some very dumb soldier. So we were loading up, and they came out. You couldn't see, but you could see shadows, you know. You could almost feel the shadows walking in front of you. But he said, don't fire anything. We let them fire first. And then they started opening fire on Tarinsky and the mortar platoon. But they had bypassed the gym. Then we opened fire. It's going to be daylight pretty soon, and we better have to save some ammunition. And so we quit. We just laid back. Yeah. But none of us got hit. And sure enough, the daylight, right before daylight, they quit coming up. And, and we were there, and we were in shock in the hole. You know, because we looked at and we saw all the little bodies, you know. And nobody knew if they were Americans or Japanese. And we got set on the edge of the crater, and the whole damn thing was carpeted with dead bodies. Now, as far as the surprises, uh, of course, this operation was short, as fast, and full of surprises. From almost the word go, we had surprises. There were kamikaze operations. The third day, they blew up Molina Tunnel. The outcome, of course, was we won the battle. The biggest, uh, I guess, the two biggest events on the island was the uh, the blowing up of the Molina Tunnel and the Monkey Point explosion. For that part, I was on on the north side of Molina Hill, yes. uh, about most of the way up. We we uh, we we had a, a, a group. It was a squad that that covered that one area up there. And uh, we spent a lot of time up there. D-Day, February 16. The 503rd had dropped about 2,000 men of its 3rd Battalion. The 2nd Battalion would arrive on the 17th by amphibian. Naval and air support continued throughout the day of the 16th. Additional support came with two battalions of the 34th Infantry, landing on South Beach around midday with men, heavy weapons, tanks, bulldozers, and flamethrowers. A-20s were strafing Melinta Hill and continued to after we were down. So we could watch that. You could watch across bottom side to Melinta Hill. But you really couldn't see bottom side and the, and the water from where we were in the, in the hill. The explosion at Monkey Point was where the Japs they were basically sealed into the caves, and they chose to blow it all up and take us if, if they could. You were never sure where the Japs were. If there were one hole, they'd come out a hole behind you, you know. And uh, your best bet was just to go ahead, if he told you to clean out a, a ravine, go on and clean it out. Do the best you can. And it usually worked that way. A minute, if a Jap wanted to surrender to me, he better be coming to me starch naked, and he better be have, have a surrender leaflet around, around his neck. Otherwise, he's a dead man. First place, the Japanese did not know what the word surrender meant. In the second place, even if they knew what it meant, they would not give up. We moved across the island. There was a lot of killing, and the flies were horrible. The, uh, the, the flies were really bad on your food, and of course, they were here because of all the uh, bodies on the on the battlefield, and uh, uh, they transferred from one to another. <laughs> they were very busy flies. And the bodies laying around all over the island, on topside, had bloated, burst open, maggots crawling out of them, stinking to high heaven, and you wanted to puke all the time. I would say losing my my best friend. I never I never thought about myself or or you know felt that I was shot bad or wounded bad or something. 
I always thought of uh, like guys like Happy, guys like uh, Freddie Morgan, McCrory, you know, guys that died, and they never came out of there. Patrols move along the beach at Rock Point, cleaning out enemy pockets in caves and cliffs. Japanese suicide boats found along the shoreline of Corregidor. Each boat had a one-man crew and carried a 300-pound charge of dynamite. Several of our ships were rammed and sunk by the boats. It's crossed Manila Bay to Corregidor, bringing General Douglas MacArthur to the island for flag-raising ceremonies. General MacArthur is met at the dock by Colonel George M. Jones, commanding officer of the 503rd Regiment. Inspecting the large coastal defense guns at Wheeler Battery overlooking the entrance to Manoa Bay. The general enters the west end of Malinta Tunnel. General MacArthur arrives at the site of the flag raising ceremony near the ruins of the officers' quarters. He had a great affection for Corregidor. He came back and a little ceremony with a few troops from each of the units that had participated. I see that the old flag staff still stands. Have your troops hoist the colors to its peak and let no enemy ever haul them down. War Corregidor has always attracted tourists, but since the Corregidor Foundation came into being in 1987 under the aegis of the Philippine Tourism Authority, it has become a growing business and has also led to the protection of the island as a war memorial. Under special lease agreements, Sun Cruises operates ferry boats to and from Corregidor, as well as guided tours and the island's main hotel, the Corregidor Inn. But I also have a very big place in my heart for all the veterans. Uh, and it's very important to me that when veterans or family members of veterans from World War II service in the Philippines come here, that we do everything we can to help them meet their own personal needs of their hearts to see the places where their family members were and served. Dr. Selma Calms, as has a military daughter who has been able to revisit the ruins of the room in which she was born at the old hospital. Many other veterans have returned to the rock. kind of a, a mission or a ministry to us in some ways that we're here. <laughs> I really like showing the people what is here, not just what is the usual tour. I wanted to go here. Okay. Finally made it. Good. Finally made it. <laughs> and what a surprise. Corregidor is still alive, still kicking, still improving. Been in love with this uh, island and of course the kind of work. What most challenged me is when I'm handling group of teachers, historians. There are almost two wars on Corregidor. There was the first Philippines campaign which led up to the surrenders in 1942, plus the retaking of the rock in early 1945. And I've been fortunate to not only visit Corregidor several times, but interview veterans. 
In our education, Japanese government are not willing to teach us what really happened. And some are telling me that in the National Library in Japan, there is no books about war. They keep it from the students. The Japanese government keep it from them. I experienced two types of the tour, English tour and the Japanese tour. English tour was fine. When I joined the Japanese tour, I felt like they are they are, how do you say, um, trying not to make Japanese people angry. So I felt like they're not telling everything. No, it must be the same and even without any uh, bad ways or bad things that you will tell to them, it must be fair. When I talked with the manager of the San Francisco the company of the corridor tour, and she said like, oh, is it okay to tell the Japanese people truth? That, that was she saying. And I said, of course. But she said like, they don't want to make the Japanese people angry because we are the Japanese people are customers. They told us about the death march, but they expressed the word with the picnic. It, it was not a picnic. It's like, what? It's not a picnic, it's a death march. Thank <laughs> you. 